Welcome, welcome to Massey College. Bono Ani, bienvenue. It's wonderful to see you all here and to have our audience that is online tonight. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm principal of Massey College. It's my great privilege to welcome you here. Uh, before we go any further, I want to acknowledge that Massey College, where these proceedings are placed, is built on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yonwandat, the Anoshani, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this land and the great privilege that we have to be here. So this is going to be a very special night, and I want to thank uh, the performers in advance uh, for what they're going to give the Massey community. And without further ado, I'm just going to pass it to uh, Hannah, who's uh, part of the uh, selection committee and the organizing committee for the Music Salon, which is a tradition uh, at Massey. And we are so grateful that we continue to do this uh, here and continue to celebrate the spirit of music, the role of music in understanding each other. And this is going to be one of very special evening to celebrate. Anna. Thank you, Natalie, for the land acknowledgement and the introduction to tonight's Massey Music Salon. Um, hello and welcome to everyone here and online tonight. Uh, we're in the cozy environs of the Colin Friesen Room. I guess it's known as the Massey Music Room now, but welcome. Um, I'm Hannah Chan Hartley. I'm a musicologist. I'm a quadrangle member, um, society member at Massey College and um, a host of tonight's event as one of the members of the programming committee for the Massey Music Society. This evening's salon, Haunted Voices, Music and Imagination in Remembering the Holocaust, marks International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which was on January 27th. And we're pleased to be joined as ecologist and educator Eleanor Johnston, uh, Ramona Met uh, mezzo-soprano Ramona Carmelli, and pianist Susan Greenway. And so I'm going to let them um, do the full introduction of uh, the event. But before they begin, I'm going to briefly introduce everybody. So Eleanor Johnston earned her master's degree in musicology at the University of Toronto and her PhD at York University, where she now teaches. Her research focuses on ways in which presented objects foster or prevent feelings of belonging and the tensions and ethical questions embedded therein. This work is in part motivated by her own experiences growing up, Jewish with an Anglo last name. The tension between the ability to quote unquote pass and the desire to represent family lost to the Shoah has informed much of her scholarly work. She particularly enjoys collaborating with performers in lecture concerts uh, exploring social and artistic themes such as Canadian musical responses to the Holocaust and Jewish diasporic works in America. She has presented at national and international conferences on the ethical presentation of Holocaust material in both music and print. In addition to her scholarly work, she has worked in the public school board as an elementary and music teacher and as the education coordinator for the Buffalo Philharmonic Orchestra. Ramona Carmelli has captivated audiences in opera, music theater, jazz, cabaret, and on the concert stage. In opera, her roles have ranged from Dido in Henry Purcell's Dido and Aeneas, to Marcellina in Mozart's The Marriage of Figaro, and Venus in Wagner's Tannhäuser. In musical theater, she has played Katisha in The Mikado, Goldie in Fiddler on the Roof, and Miss Hannigan in Annie. She was honored the angel and narrator in the 2015 premiere of David Warwick's multi-faith oratorial, Abraham and she looks forward to creating the title role in Don't Call Me Mama, a biographical portrait of Mama Cass Elliot. She will also reprise her role as the iconic Canadian artist Emily Carr in Janet Skaretsky and Di Brandt's upcoming opera, We Will Walk in the Forest. She is occasionally found in reruns of the Lifetime Global TV series Busick Wild Card as the oblivious diva on stage amid murder and mayhem. <laughs> <laughs> Susan Greenway is a freelance pianist, accompanist, chair musician, and teacher based in Toronto. She holds a master's degree in piano performance from the University of Toronto with a specialization in collaborative piano. Recently, she accompanied flautist Ron Korb on his Grammy-nominated CD, Asia Beauty. As a young pianist, she won awards for her playing in the Canadian music competitions and the finals of the Qantas music competitions, both as a soloist and in chamber music. She studied extensively at the Banff Centre, working with Anton Querty, André Laplante, and other master teachers. 
In addition to her performing career, she now teaches herself and has a flourishing studio of approximately 50 students. Please join me in welcoming Eleanor, Ramona, and Susan. Thank you, Hannah, for that lovely introduction. And good evening to all of you. Thank you for coming and joining us here. We are here tonight to ask a question. And that question may seem romantic, but it is both urgent and serious. The question exists as only music and questions can in the past, the present, and the future. A past in which anti-Semitism was so much the fabric of everyday life that you could not be a public servant and a Jew, as Mahler discovered. A present that continues to secularize victims of the Holocaust, such as Anne Frank, and a longed for future in which prejudice is confronted, dissected, and removed. And I think we're moving in that direction. First, to ask my question, then I will define a few of its terms. And finally, we will stake that argument to several haunted and haunting musical encounters in city, shtetl, and synagogue. This question is part of a larger project about education and the ethical complications of encounters with the Holocaust, so I'm experimenting on you tonight. It's a quest that's only barely begun, and I look forward to dialogue. Our question tonight is this. Can we create a haunted imagination through music? Can we create a haunted imagination through music? Why? You might ask me, aren't we already haunted enough? We're haunted by lingering anti-Semitic tropes. A child asked me recently, uh, isn't it anti-Semitic that the main character becomes an ugly evil by growing a long nose? I mean, yes, but I don't think they meant it that way. <laughs> by six million dead, which is just under the current population of Toronto, by contested land, by absent loved ones, Dayenu, no? I answer no, not quite haunted enough. In this context, we are speaking of hauntings in the very beautiful, very political language of Avery Gordon, who uses this concept to trace the lives of people through historical documents in which they are erased or unrecorded due to prejudice. When it comes to the Holocaust or the Shoah, a project proudly and meticulously documented by its readers, a historical record to which testimony has added and continues to add. I think of these erasures more as lives, as identities, as relatives, as stories that are no longer told. Recipes no longer cooked, contributions to thought, invention, work not made, voices that no longer sing. Their names and fates are often recorded, but their humanity is erased. The ghosts we are looking for are those that remind us we are here. We have always been here. In Ghostly Matters, Gordon draws on uncanny encounters in the historical and sociological work of Patricia Williams, who traces the history of her great-great-grandmother to who was black through the writings of Austin Miller, who owned her great-great-grandmother. Williams refers to this quest as searching for her shape in his hand. Gordon then applies this technique to close readings of the historical fiction of Valenzuela and Lynn, and an archival encounter with a photograph which ought but does not include Sabrina Spielman. Spielman was a patient, collaborator, a student, maybe a lover of Freud and Jung. And Gordon works into these absences, these hauntings, to attempt to uncover and bring peace to those hidden by a history and academic orientation towards what she called white male. And this is how she ends this lovely book. Because ultimately, haunting is about how to transform a shadow of a life into an undiminished life, whose shadows touch softly in the spirit of a peaceful reconciliation. In this necessarily collective undertaking, the end, which is not an ending at all, belongs to everyone. I begin with her concept of the uncanny and the erased, but I am not seeking peace. I am rather borrowing from Fry, seeking to create a haunted imagination, 
one in which the losses engendered by prejudice, tonight specifically anti-Semitism, inform our, our understandings of the world, ourselves, and our inherited prejudices. Indeed, I am seeking in part to fill Spargo's ethical stance of perpetual mourning in response to the Shoah. In this, I am inspired and supported by Krasny's work with young adult historical fiction, but turning from one creative endeavor, writing, to another, music. Gordon finds her ghosts in documents and photographs and buildings in her writings on Breitenau, but we are going to hear our ghosts. In Mahler's music, in Freund Stimme, and in the Jewish liturgy, which though it appears in testimony, is often not heard in the public sphere. Just as we find Jewish voices in the city, in the shtetl, and in the synagogue, so too must we attend to music in each place. And I find music particularly fitting to this project of haunting, because it does linger in the ear, from history through to the present. We will call forth the haunted rooms in the mansions of your mind through music. And like a magician, I will send you forth tonight with an earworm of resilience, love, and tragedy. So to consider music in the city, let us encounter Mahler, an excellent student of the Torah, raised Jewish family, documented as having an agnostic bent, Freud described him as an atheist, who, as Wikipedia says, had a perhaps pragmatic conversion to Roman Catholicism just prior to his appointment to the Vienna Hof Oper, his lifelong goal. And here's our first ghost. This pragmatic conversion points to peace we often leave out of our discussion of anti-Semitism as the Holocaust. Anti-Semitism in Europe, America, Canada, was centuries old. When Hitler chose his scapegoat for the ills of the German Republic, he had merely to scratch the surface of old hates. From the Jew of Malta, the merchant of Venice, the expulsion from Spain, from England, the established ghettos, dress codes, work restrictions, auto de fe's, and informal annual cruelties inspired by the story of the blood libel and the attribution of Jesus' death to the Jews. This is a problematic section from the Bible, and it's still read over morning announcements in our publicly funded Catholic school boards in Ontario. Pogroms, the Pale of Salem, settled, and on. When I read accounts of those in pre-war Germany and Austria and Poland and Romania, saying, surely this recent unpleasantness should settle soon, I'm so frustrated. I want to tell them, run. But after all, the historical record was on their side for centuries. It had mostly, more or less, somewhat, passed. <sighs> Surely you say, Mahler is not a ghost. He is widely accepted as a Jewish composer by both the Jewish community and anti-Semitic critics alike. During his lifetime, his appointment was criticized. It was feared that he would dilute the German nature of the state opera. His music was declared Antarctica by the Nazis, degenerate, and its performance was banned. We have his letters, and his writings, and Freud's notes on their encounter. How can he be a ghost? We're borrowing his music tonight to populate our minds with the ghosts of those who considered themselves more German than Jewish, but discovered that they were Jewish enough for Hitler. It reminds us of an ongoing discomfort with cosmopolitan Jewish identities. There's this obsessive search in research about Mahler for Jewish or Oriental or Klezmer influences in his music. And also the erasure of Jewish as a category in diversity surveys, the quotas in this institution, U of T, on Jewish medical students, which was documented as late as 59. So I'd like to tell you about the song we're going to sing tonight. Liebstuhm Schönheit is grouped in with the Rückert leader, but it was written a year later, in 1902. It's sort of an afterthought. And we've chosen to perform it this evening for two reasons. The charming and provocative text speaks to our human desire to be loved for love, that is, for ourselves. And after all, isn't that the haunting I am asking for? I had intended to make an, an argument here for the ways in which this particular lead might have echoes of Mahler's Jewish ch childhood, but I 
don't want to. Bahler viewed himself as part of the Germanic tradition, and he makes tremendous use here of an established pianistic tradition with a rich and chordal accompaniment, which employs so much chromatic tone pointing that we all float in tonal uncertainty. We're forced to live the anxiety of the poet through the music. And yet, I'll tell you after all, in his suspension, use of suspensions over a tonic dominant pedal, highly chromatic coloring, and uh, this slightly off kilter phrasing, Mahler creates a seductive and poignant and longing and slightly exotic effect, which uh, is a tendency in Mahler's music, which Adorno suggested was maybe used as cover for his Jewish heritage. This is almost as bad as getting into the car with my husband. He's six foot two, so you know, seat goes forward, seat goes back. All right. <laughs> <sighs> mm -hmm. So many of Mahler's circle, subject to the somewhat casual anti-Semitism of the day, as I described, were largely sheltered by their economic and geographic locations until the Anschluss. And they're well documented in history. We have journals and concert programs and pictures. For many who ultimately perished due to Nazi atrocities, there are few, if any, records. For those ciphers, music works particularly well to fill into those spaces. It raises the possibility of many fully human voices under and around our single voice tonight. 
And this is why our program is a little unbalanced. We have one Mahler and five songs by Helen Greenberg. Um, <laughs> I just, we couldn't find one to leave out, could we? Yeah. <coughs> and so, in Freundstimme, where we will raise our next apparition, it is, it turns longing, playful, cynical, romantic, and dreaming in exploring the world of the shtetl and the ghettos. It documents in post-memory the banal but nonetheless important treasured lives of women in more rural settings. We deal with themes of unrequited love, and I have seen a bird, frustration in the fool next to me, lullabies in drowsing birds, envy in wives, and erotic yearning, because what's life without a little love? In I Stand in the Midday, there are six women involved in its creation. The composer, Helen Greenberg, you see here, has chosen to set five poems ish, each poem from the pen of a different author. Helen Greenberg was born in Baltimore in 1939, and this accident of geography allowed her to grow up and complete post-secondary studies in English literature, a study which she put to good use in her selection of song texts. She was also able to move from the States to Canada, where she pursued private composition studies, Oscar Morowitz, Edward Laufer, and Jules Irving Glick. Those from the Faculty of Music might recognize some of those names. Greenberg has written a large amount of secular as well as sacred music and showed particular interest in leader in Yiddish, Hebrew, and English. She spent much of her adult life in Montreal and Toronto, and she contributed measurably to Canadian Jewish musical life. Although we don't really hear her music, I hope you'll agree with me after you hear this. Freund's Drimma continues to restrict women to the domestic fear sphere, but it makes some highly strategic moves towards agency. The poems are brash and cynical, longing, erotic, and embrace Yiddish as a language of women as we are, rather than the idealized and subjected woman of many traditional German leader. As Rick notes, Yiddish was historically associated with women through its status as Mama Lotion, or mother tongue. And because women did not historically study the Torah, reading and writing were taught to them through local languages and Yiddish. Yiddish, therefore, he says, felt both feminine and Jewish to women writing in the early to mid 20th century. The lives and fates of these women poets, look at those beautiful faces, also speak to the diverse experiences of Jews in Europe. Dora Teitelbaum escaped the Shoah with a luckily timed emigration. She moved to the US from Lithuania in 1932, just about the nick of time. She worked in a sweatshop in America, emigrated to Israel, and lived into her 80s, writing poetry. The poem set here, I Have Seen a Swallow, follows a simple repeated structure, which is sensitively set by Greenberg in a strophic or repeated verses form, with harmonic underpainting and textures in the piano to support the imagery of the text. The introduction fe features um, an undulating, descending figure, reminiscent of Debussy, which flies over the keys, gently descending to presage the wounded swallow of the final verse. Despite the character's sad experiences, the swallow does fall, the rose is plucked, the tree is bent in the storm. The song ends with wistful hope on a rising phrase, I am still ready to love. In this beautiful setting, I am reminded of the survivors who, despite tremendous physical and psychological hardships, found ways to learn. Our next poet, Malka Heifetz Tussman, was born in Bohemia and emigrated with her family in 1912 to Chicago. This sarcastic and cynical and very funny poem about the danger of arguing with fools and the danger of fools in general is given an up-tempo setting in which dotted rhythms create a, an almost dance-like atmosphere if you were dancing in construction boots. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere between a square dance and a marching band. <laughs> the biting notes of the piano match the savage words. A cultured fool can destroy the world, and yet I am foolish with a fool. After the dramatic diction of makes me a fool, the singer and piano end almost on a 
musical shrug, with the piano indulging in one last dance-like figure. The cynical, if funny setting, is a brutal contrast to the literally haunting and haunted lullaby of the next song. Here we return to the image of a bird, but this is a different, softer, less hopeful sort of bird. Leah Radnitsky or Radnika wrote the poem Drowsing Birds in the Vilna ghetto, under the shadow of the Gestapo who eventually murdered her, we think, at Mechdanik. This very famous poem was a reaction to an account of a child survivor of the massacre at Polnar. The sentence of by Greenberg begins in a major key with the traditional rocking rhythms of a lullaby, but introduces modal mixtures in the second half as the story of death and separation intrudes. The song trails to silence, leaving us to wonder if the child or the singer survive. It insists that we attend to all the erased lines in Jewish family trees and that against the separations of families. However, I am not trying to evoke a simple, sympathetic connection. And one thing that I really love about this song cycle is that it insists on women not only as mothers or lovers, but complex human beings who participate in political and cultural life are sometimes nice of each other, sit of an evening, and ponder their lives. Our next poem presents the gossipy life of a village while underscoring the ways in which women's lives at the time were circumscribed by their husbands. The poet, Bertha Kling, emigrated from Novoredok in Belarus to New York as a teenager. An accomplished poet and singer, particu particularly of Yiddish folk songs, she is also remembered for running a Yiddish salon from her Bronx apartment, which nurtured the Junge, America's first Yiddish modernist literature movement. That's a mouthful. This poem, with its frequent repetitions and quicksilver portraits, evokes for me the front stoops of immigrant Jewish communities. Catching a moment of leaf in the dying light of day. The setting is intensely human, humorous, folksy, rising to a dramatic crescendo on a man like mine. And yet, rolling on to a final tonic flourish in the piano. It reminds me that we didn't make saints, nor martyrs, murdered by anti-Semitism in order to mourn their erasure from the book of life and history. The they, they are who they are. The final poem in this cycle returns us to love and longing. It's a little bit enigmatic, likening the author to a stalk of grain, ripe, heavy, brown, falling at the feet of the beloved in the It reminds me a little of Keats' mellow mists of fruitfulness. Greenberg responds to this mature longing of the writer and more than a whiff of homesickness in the poem, particularly with the poppies of late summer, which we associate with Ukraine, with a setting that sits confidently in the middle of the voice, supported by lush chords and romantic chords in the piano. Beginning in the minor key, the piano moves to major to describe what we may consider as a nostalgic evocation of summer and the dramatic fall of her brown body at the feet of her lover. As the light fades, the setting returns to the minor key, leaving us to wonder whether this falling is a big or a little death. This poem and the turbulent life of its author remind me of the many dislocations of Jewish people. Korn was born in Galicia, fled the First World War to Vienna, returned to Poland, was evacuated by the Russian powers to Uzbekistan and then Moscow before emigrating to Canada in 1948. And although she spent much of her career writing in Montreal, I did not encounter her poems anywhere on any of my syllabi in school here. Let's listen to those songs.
Do you hear that? Is that Beethoven? You know, my Austro-Hungarian, or Hebrew, when she immigrated here, great-grandmother insisted that Beethoven was Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't. <laughs> our host is of the camp, um, and we hear him only in our imaginations. And he comes from the extraordinary testimony turned novel of Eli Wiesel. Having managed miraculously not only to survive three years in the camp with both his life and his violin, Juliak plays a fragment of a Beethoven concerto in a barracks. The eight pause in a death march, a final push that Wiesel has vividly described as removing whatever remained of their humanity, breaking even the bonds between fathers and sons. At some point, crammed in so tightly that there is a danger of suffocation, Wiesel falls asleep to the sound of the ghostly violin. In the morning, Julia frozen, his violin a tiny trampled corpse beside him. But Julia is an unplanned eruption. I wanted to skirt the outsides of the camp, so horror I would rather leave in a locked room. But his self-played requiem of a Beethoven violin concerto in defiance of the edict that Jewish musicians not corrupt this music by playing it reminds of an important warning. Though I have pointed to ongoing resilience, excellence, persistence in the stories of Jewish musical life, they in no way are redeemed or justified or a condolence for the barriers and brutalities enacted by anti-Semitic policies. I am not offering a bomb to the soul. I'm offering a spur to action. And so I pause a moment at this story, which has many of the hallmark marks of a romantic fairy tale, the artist who must create even to the point of death, even in death, to remember that attempts to derive meaning from the suffering or the triumphs of victims and survivors of the Holocaust are antithetical to the moral imperatives that it presents. And <laughs> what is the moral imperative of the Holocaust? Many survivors say they tell their story to ensure that such a thing never happens again. And I said our question was urgent. Why urgent? We just marked the 78th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. Surely we could say this was one of the history books. However, I would argue that passing from living memory to received testimony is precisely what makes it urgent. There has been a rise of anti-Semitism, prejudice, and scapegoating behavior um, of all sorts of people <laughs> within the last decade, which makes the preventative arm of Holocaust Memorial much more urgent. And this is where I think a haunted imagination might be particularly effective. If like smelling the perfume of a deceased beloved, we could be suddenly pushed into the uncanny by a tune, a phrase, a picture that seems rather like one we remember, then maybe we will be forced to pause, to reckon our past, and make a different choice for our future. And those two words, our past and our future, always evoke for me the practice of Judaism as a religion, the liturgy which winds through even my quite secular existence, the melodies I sing to mark the week, the turning of the year, and life's occasions bind me securely to a chain of tradition shared with my ancestors. These are melodies live most often at the synagogue. And our final encounter this evening is with a person who found comfort and strength in her identity as a Jew. We will not delve into the graphic aspects of her experiences. We're not looking for catharsis. But I would like to explore the ways in which Felicia Steigman Carmeli's life and experiences haunt in the most productive and positive sense of the word, myself and my friend, her daughter, Ramona Carmeli. And speaking of hauntings and the personal, 
this next section was the hardest to write. I kept putting off reading Felicia's memoir. Ramona and I kept saying, well, we could talk about it tomorrow. Her story is overall a positive one. She survived, even flourished. Uh, unlike many, Felicia spent the entire war with her parents, and that small nuclear unit survived intact. But it's the first time that I have read the testimony of someone I knew personally. And I found it much more difficult. To read or to hear testimony is to become a witness oneself. And much has been written of the difficulties of these acts. Uh, and I can give you references if you like. When listening to testimony, we need to care not only for the one giving the testimony, but those receiving it. In the end, I did read the relevant chapter. It's called Death Surrounds Us. And if you would like to hear more details of her whole life, her memoir is available on Amazon, and it's really wonderful. Ramona, do you want me to summarize, or would you like to talk? Um, I, I would actually prefer you to it at the moment. Thank That's you. fine. We did it both ways. Very briefly, Felicia tells us of a cherished and comfortable childhood, the only child of her parents with a large extended family. She lives in a comfortable home, is spoiled with presents on her birthday, attends school, and feels very much a part of the community around her. Slowly, however, the approaching war changes things. She is expelled from school along with the other Jewish students. Um, her parents begin to have what she describes as shushing conversations. They stop when she comes into the room. Daily life is increasingly restricted until on her 10th birthday, she is surprised to receive no presents, no cake, no celebration. Shortly thereafter, the family is deported on a cattle car, forced to cross the Dniester River and walk from Mogilev to Sharga Road. All those who did not keep up were shot. Uh, and Felicia describes what she saw and what she still remembers. Felicia, her mother, her father, her paternal grandparents, her uncle Armin and his wife, lived in Sharga Road, which functioned as a sort of informal ghetto, until liberation in 1944. Her grandparents, unfortunately, were amongst the 36 family members that she lost in the war. <sighs> there were some attempts to, um, can we move to the next slide, please? There were some attempts to maintain a sense of daily life for her. Uh, on the left, you see her with her classmates in an informal school with Madame Victor. There were tasks of daily life. And Uncle Ehrman emerges as uh, something of a hero in this story. He develops a relationship with the local resistance, which allows him to bring some food into the ghetto and to make a plan for hiding the family in an underground, uh, <laughs> that's my phone, <laughs> in an underground um, bunker that they dig themselves. Thank you. In the final days of the German occupation, um, they know that it's safe to come out when they hear a Russian being sung by the resistance who liberates them. It took a year to walk home, and Felicia celebrated her 13th birthday with an entire slice of bread that was just for her. On returning, the authorities granted them a single room in her former house. Just one. Those three terrible years between her 10th and 13th birthday shaped the rest of Felicia's life and ways Ramona's and now mine. Her parents had been approached by a Romanian couple who offered to adopt her. But they decided uh, a risk that didn't always pay off but worked out in this case. Where we go, she goes. Felicia writes that she is grateful to have remained with her parents, to have retained her Jewish identity, history, and culture. She says, I would not have gained the strength and fortitude I have had it not been for my experiences during the war, which strengthened my will to live. That strength of identity and will is very much present in the rest of her story. She organizes the creation of a high school in Dorna. She joins the Young Zionists and the Young Communist Party. Um, when that doesn't work out, she emigrates to Israel and then Canada. She takes a master's of social work. Uh, remember that she spoke German and Romanian Russian. <laughs> and Russian <laughs> already. 
uh, a PhD in psychology in English. Uh, and she spent much of her practice, her work um, with survivors, including in addition to her own memoirs, she uh, wrote and published the, I think it's still the scholarly work on, um, in English, in English <laughs> on Transnistria and the, um, the ghettos and camps there, which included collecting testimony from many survivors. She also um, traveled to Russia and other places um, to interview people for the Spielberg Foundation when Steven Spielberg was 20, 20 years ago started to do his Shoah Foundation to collect the testimony as people were starting to die <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because she had the languages and the skill set. Yeah. Um, and so I, I had the privilege of knowing Felicia a little bit through Ramona but I didn't know her well, and when she came to the end of her life, I visited in palliative care. And I'm going to just tell you this story because I think it gives you really a sense of who she was as a person. Um, and so we bonded over discussing child rearing. I have two children. And um, she said to me, why don't you write a book? about raising children. You're obviously such an involved mother. A and I was writing my doctoral dissertation and said, I don't think I have time, Felicia. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't. Um, <laughs> but she said, well, no, you think you don't have time. But this year, you write the chapter about five-year-olds. And next year, you write the chapter about six-year-olds. And in five years, you'll have a book about the five to 10-year-old child. Um, take that <laughs> advice. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yet. Yet. <laughs> um, however, I feel that this is very much how Felicia approached life. I might as well do it. Life is short, and it keeps going either way. And the questions I didn't get to ask her were how she approached life in the pri private sphere, and examples she said of a Jewish home. And how did she navigate raising a child in such a different context from her own childhood? And since we've explored all the rest of our questions tonight in song, I wonder, Rabona, are there any uh, pieces of the liturgy that you remember singing with your mother? Uh, <laughs> we've set this up, so just <laughs> so you know. <laughs> in case anyone doubts spoiler that, alert. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spoiler, spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Um, so, my mother and I had a very um, complicated relationship, and very, very, very close, very, very, very enmeshed, very turbulent at times due to her childhood and the way that that impacted my childhood. But one thing that was really, it, it didn't matter how, how well we were or weren't getting along, at least later when I was an adult, um, often my mother would come to the synagogues in which I sang and we picked up something that had been um, part of our, my childhood, which is mom and I would sing Avinu Malkenu together in harmony. And uh, from when I was a very little girl, and um, it, later on in life, I remember being in the synagogue choir and seeing her in the congregation and catching her eye at that point in the holiday services, and we would just do it again. And um, it, it was it was this constant bridge that that we kept returning to. Um, regardless of how complicated our life and our relationship as mother and daughter, and everybody here who is a mother or a daughter will understand that, uh, <laughs> got, we, uh, we always did this. So we thought maybe you would like to join us. I don't know who, he, uh, raise your hands, anybody who knows of Inu Monk. Okay, so we'll teach it to the rest of the people. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so please feel free to sing along. The words aren't here, but yes, we're we'll okay. figure it out. <laughs> They're
sein. mother when she likes what I'm saying. <laughs> um, thank you very much. That's all we have formally to say, but I uh, that you have questions and ideas and things to share. We can have a little discussion. And I think, Hannah, you're going to yes. organize that. If there's any questions, I'm going to pass you the mic. This is it's just for the, the audience online. So is there anybody who have? junior fellow here at college, and I had a question that kind of related to the theme of, of the haunted imagination. So coming out of this, I feel like I'm able to grasp, you know, what it is that uh, the haunted imagination might look like. But I'm wondering, do you think that there's a way to develop your capacity to be haunted? Because I was thinking about, um, like, I'm not coming to this with you know, deep, deep knowledge of the subject. So I'm wondering if maybe certain abilities or certain knowledges help someone uh, kind of extend the capacity to be haunted. Uh, I think that's a beautiful question <laughs> and uh, something that I'm hoping to explore further. I, I do think the more we learn, uh, the more haunted we become. Mm -hmm. Um, not in a sort of awful way, but in a, a comforting way. Felicia's mother, uh, Felicia, Ramona's mother, sort of walks with me in my work now, um, as do many others whose stories I've read, uh, Pinkus Kutcher. But, um, but I think we have to start somewhere. So if we start with a little haunting Juliet's story, then perhaps it creates the desire or the interest to begin to learn more, um, and and of course those who have more personal connections to the trauma probably are already haunted. May I add something? Yeah. Um, I think also it's in uh, your mic. I think I'm mic. Yeah. Um, for me, mm -hmm. it's important to get into the human the the mundane even, the banal side of the people that we're learning about. It's not just about the atrocities mm -hmm. and, and, you know, similarly with what we're doing with Truth and Reconciliation, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, unfortunately we're, we're being, um, we're, we're learning every day about greater atrocities or at least larger of the atrocities that we were told about but never really heard. Um, and, and, it's more for me about learning about the people and their mundane lives and how that shifted and that's that's why we seem to sort of shift when we started this project it drifted more into this area of you know the daily life of for example the women in the Freudian Stimme um, as opposed to you know more art or music from the camps a lot of that work is being done and it's wonderful work and it's very important work 
and we have participated in some of that ourselves. But in, in, in much the same way, I'm now involved in another project um, about um, well, it's got it's got a connection to truth and reconciliation through a relationship between Canadian artist Emily Carr and her friend Sophie Frank Sewinchelwit, and um, learning about the humanity and the daily life and the personal tragedies, uh, the, or the or the or the personal foibles, or the you know the, the humor and 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 just that that adds, I think to our ability to be haunted because we're being haunted by real people, not stories of some historic thing that happened um, or, or not historic thing, unfortunately, but you know, um, current things are happening all the time. Um, that's the part I think that helps us engage as, well, for me as an artist, um, and for us, I think, as people, whether academics or just people who are interested in basic humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We have a few yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. And then I will pass it back. Well, thank you very much. My name is Wanja. I'm a journalist, a journalist for human rights and a Masi fellow. I must say it's a very refreshing way of uh, putting this here. Your presentation is just wonderful. Refreshing in the sense that uh, I think when I came here, probably I was expecting to hear those uh, trauma and horrors to the camps. But I find something more refreshing and more beautiful. I resonate with that very much. It's very moving. Keep doing that. Thank you. Yeah, because we need to see that other side. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have a question? You just pass the mic back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Marissa Herzig, and uh, I'm actually a Swedish right now, and so this was really, really wonderful uh, to see on many levels. Um, this is just more of a curiosity. Um, you mentioned another project. I wonder what um, you both are up to next, actually. I, I would love to see more of your work. <laughs> um, well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, I hope you'll be invited back. Um, my, my next piece with this work is actually um, Imagine a Brinda Bar throughout uh, a school, a sort of a child's life at school from kindergarten through grade six. Um, and that we're sort of thinking about where we might take this or expand this program a little more, but we'll keep you posted. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Did you have it? Or yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> If I could just make a comment, my name is Robert de Vrij, um, or de Vrij, if you want to say it in Dutch. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to speak for a moment to the haunted imagination issue because I think it's very easy um, for people, for example, to blame the Germans for the Shoah, for the Holocaust, and but you can't blame anybody for it. I mean. Go ahead, blame Hitler if you want, but I don't care. Um, I, I think that what haunts me more and more about this and all sorts of other things that we do to our fellow human beings, regardless of what country we come from or you know, what religion we are, it's just our capacity to act in this way. I mean, to speak to Germany for one second, one of my favorite countries, one of the most sophisticated, uh, intellectual, um, wonderfully talented, artistic, beautiful countries in the entire world. Um, and the, f the fact mentioned tonight that, you know, Jews in Germany just considered themselves to be German, like Mahler, I think you said that. Uh, mm -hmm. Eleanor, you know, like, uh, it reminds me of the musical Cabaret where Herr Schultz says, well, I understand the Germans, but am I? I'm a German, you know, like, it, it has nothing to do, it, we must be very, very, very careful not to blame any particular country or race for this. We just, we do this all the time to one another on a regular basis. Well, I'm pretty 
comfortable and, blaming those countries, but I, I do really appreciate, Robert, your larger point about, um, <laughs> sorry, I, I am, but, but your larger point that uh, human beings in general, history, right. um, particularly um, in colonial history, have perpetrated really dreadful things against each other. Oh, sure. They and so... Like British have, I mean, yeah. you know, everybody. I mean, it's amazing. So that, that I don't think it's never again piece... The Dutch, my Dutch heritage, the Dutch have done terrible things. It's more about oh, accountability. Yeah. No, and, and it is about... It's about account. No, it's about accountability. Robert, I'm sorry. It's just right behind Somebody you. Somebody else. are almost I, out I of time. I have to add something in before the clock runs out. Okay. <laughs> sorry, um, Robert. Uh, I wanted to say thank you. And for me, I personally have been having a moment of like, why art? What is art? And what is it for? Which is a weird place to be because I'm an artist. <laughs> but Arno uh, said that to write poetry after the Holocaust was barbarous. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the nude is Auschwitz with somebody mm -hmm. else. I think mm -hmm. maybe the same person. Um, but seeing this and, and not seeing, listening. Um, which is such a, a, a great sense to engage with in terms of gathering knowledge, especially through music, um, on like a, you know, a spiritual level. Um, I was really reminded of, not to operationalize art, but that it, there's so much learning of like, on this human sense that comes through this program. And as you mentioned, the, the, um, the humanity of people, not the um, not the dehumanized body that we so often mm -hmm. imagine when we think of the hospital. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I really want to thank you for bringing people to life instead of just having them here as ghosts. Thank you. I think we're all, I think we're out of time. I think we're out yeah. of time. Thank you everyone for <laughs> letting me haunt you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is. I'm just going to have some, make some final <laughs> comments. <laughs> oh no, I've got a mic. All right. <laughs> I know everyone's really eager to talk. <laughs> no, thank you. Yes, <laughs> just some final remarks. Um, thank you, Eleanor, Ramona, Susan, for this wonderful presentation, um, really illuminating and moving. And I believe we're going to have this available um, online. So anybody, you, you know, feel free. Once, once we have the um, video, you please share it. I mean, it's to you know, spread, spread um, this, this uh, project. And then I'm really looking forward to seeing what, <laughs> what more you'll do. <laughs> Just, um, and on behalf of the Massey Music Society, I want to thank um, Joe Costa for producing this event. Thank you, <laughs> Yay, Joe. <laughs> and to Alyssa Ginsberg for coordinating everything. And thank you all of you for joining us tonight here and online. Um, we hope you enjoyed this evening's salon. We've got one more coming up um, on March 1st. We in Jamaican multidimensional musical artist Alana Stewart. And she will be speaking in conversation with Canadian music historian and author Michael Barclay, talking about her music, her influences, and her many collaborative projects. And she is also going to preview some new unreleased work. So please visit the Massey site to sign up, and we'd love to see you there. Thank you and good night. Thank you. <laughs>